Thank you. Uh, can you hear me well? Okay. So yeah, my name is Zoe. I'm working at the Max Planck Institute for Metrology in Hamburg on my PhD, together with Jean Song von Storch. This project is financed by the TRR 181, and the topic was just read out. So impact of a mesoscale eddy on the M2 internal tide in a five kilometer icon ocean simulation. First, I wanna talk about the motivation. Why are we interested in this topic? So what you see here comes from a visualization by NASA, it's satellite altimetry, and they show the internal tide surface elevation at different, uh, at different ocean basins. We can see there is a significant part in centimeters in almost all ocean basins of the internal tide signature. We also know from previous research that the diapycnal mixing induced by internal tides contributes significantly to sustaining the global overturning circulation. In fact, it was estimated to be around one terawatt of energy. What we also know is that the biggest part of this internal tide energy is carried by the low mode tides which have long horizontal structures that can propagate further away from the generation side. After they propagate, at some point, this energy is dissipated, but we don't know yet exactly how this dissipation happens. There are different processes that are possible. We see here some examples. Uh, topographic interactions, as was mentioned yesterday, nonlinear wave-wave interactions, and also the uh, project that we are focusing on internal tide interacting with mesoscale eddies. What we see here is just a simplified sketch of how this interaction might take place. We have here a steep topography in the bottom of the ocean and the barotropic surface tide flowing over that, which generates the baroclinic or internal tides. These different kinds of waves are supposed to uh, simulate or indicate the different modes. So we can have low modes, as I said before, with long structures which propagate far away, or higher modes, which are more unstable. They have smaller horizontal scales, and they can break and dissipate the energy quite close to the topography, to the generation side. So this is why we focus mostly on the low modes and how they can interact with mesoscale eddies, which have normally similar uh, scales in the horizontal. There have been already some observational studies. We see here two examples, one in the Azores and one in the South China Sea. The first study found that eddies can dump the energy flux in the first and second mode. And then they say that this could be an indication of scattering of energy from lower to higher modes. In the second example, they also found some weakening of the low modes and they could also calculate that the propagation of the mode one was slower inside a cyclonic eddy and faster inside an anticyclonic eddy. But of course, as we know, observations are still too sparse, both in space and time. That's why there have been as well theoretical and numerical approaches considered to provide more details in this problem. Here I'm just citing some of these examples. On the, on the previous slide, what was the reference there? Sorry? Uh, the previous slide, you had some text there. Yes. Uh, the so this energy is just sink of tides, you had some text there. Can you go back to that? That was just yeah. Which which reference is that, and what are they showing? Is energy being transferred from waves to eddies or to higher modes of tides? They are suggesting that the energy can be transferred to higher modes. They are not able to resolve higher modes. They just see that the energy inside the eddy is dumped. The energy flux in this case. They are just suggesting that this can be uh, caused by scattering. And, and which reference was that? It's uh, the first paper I am showing here, Loeb et al, 2017. So to continue, yes, so we have both uh, theoretical and numerical approaches as well. They both suggest that an eddy as well can scatter the incident wave into waves with higher wave number, which can then lead to dissipation. Here I just want to show one of these examples of these studies, which was recently published last year by Wang and Leg. You have on the left their idealized setup with a homogeneous incoming tidal wave, and here a stationary eddy, in this case a baroclinic one, but they had also different examples. Some flat topography and then the sponge layer on the right. And on the right you have the energy flux in the experiment only with internal tides, and below the case where there is an eddy as well ed added. And what they find is that for the mode one, the energy flux is refracted into those convergent beams that you can see after the interaction with the eddy in all different cases of eddies that they looked at. 
When they then go into the higher modes, which you can see here, mode two and three, they do some ray tracings, which start on those black points. The, the circle is indicating the eddy, and the colors are indicating the time in days that they can measure those rays. And what they can see is that the higher the mode, the longer these rays are trapped inside the eddy. But of course, still does not really answer the question of what happens in a realistic ocean. And this is what we are trying to do using Icon O. So just a few words about Icon, because I believe that not so many people are aware of that. So we have a new generation air system model um, at, developed at the Max Planck Institute. Uh, it is based on this icosahedral grid, triangular grid of 20 triangles, and it has different components, ocean, land, atmosphere, which can be run coupled or also separately, which is what we do. We run the ocean-only component uh, with a very high horizontal resolution, which is uh, um, created when we recursively divide those triangles into smaller triangles. Then we have some very high vertical resolution as well solving the primitive equations and including, in this case, also the lunisolar tide um, in the momentum equation to be able to resolve the barotropic tide. So in this talk, I'm going to separate my questions and answer into two uh, categories. First, we are focusing on the model. So how does the internal tide look like in this particular simulation? When we want to study what happens to the modes, what model decomposition method is appropriate to study this? And also, is this model with this particular resolution capable of simulating high modes? Then we're going to look at the interactions with the eddies to answer how does a traveling eddy, which is being resolved in the simulation, affect the beams? Can this eddy also scatter the low modes into higher modes, as has been suggested in the past, but not really shown? And is there any weakening of the tide which is caused by the eddy? So let's begin with a model. What you see here is a time series of the kinetic energy of our run. We have a quite long spin-up run, more than, a bit more than 10 years. And until we have a um, stationary eddy field, then this gray area indicates the point where we switch on the tides for our, around one and a half years. And the next two gray bars indicate the periods where we rerun the model with the same setup, but very high uh, frequency for the output, which is one hour in this case. And I think it's a bit too small to see. It's two different seasons, February and March, and then June and July of the same year, but the results I will show will only be from the first season. The focus area we are interested in is located in the Southeast Atlantic, close to the Walvis Ridge. We see on the left um, the, the interface displacement of the internal tide globally where we have here this Walvis Ridge, the generation point. On the right, we have a global map of the eddies, of mesoscale eddies. And we see as well here the Agulas rings. So it's a very nice area to study both features and their interactions because they are both quite strongly present. Our realistic setup, I want to briefly also talk about this. We have here two maps of the certification at two different depths and then a vertical uh, plot as well we can see that we have a horizontally quite varying stratification in all levels, or mostly all levels. Here we have a look at the mean current and the bathymetry. The mean current shows us that we have a quite complicated background uh, next to these interactions, as well as the, in the upper parts of the ocean, but also in the lower parts. We have those bigger mesoscale eddies, which we will focus on in the Next section, they are mostly anticyclonic and baroclinic, but also many meandering and smaller eddies. Um, the bathymetry, as I just show, said, we have the Walvis Ridge where the internal tide is generated, the Mid Atlantic Ridge here on the left, and also some, some smaller ridges and sea mounts in the area. A bit on the methodology. First, we want to decompose uh, or no, first we want to extract the M2 internal tide. And we do this by first depth averaging the velocities and subtracting them from the full velocities which are given to us by the model. Then we do per harmonic analysis to extract the one frequency we're interested in, which is the most dominant semi-diurnal tide in the uh, Southeast Atlantic, the M2. 
And doing this, we arrive to this picture. So you see here the M2 internal tide zonal velocity in the focus area. We have the topography here in black, and you can see the nice um, strong beams propagating away from the ridge in all different directions at M2 frequency. We're going to focus on a smaller area, and we're going to be mainly talking about one of these beams that is generated here and then propagates eastwards towards the continent of Africa. Uh, here I'm showing one of the interesting features of the, uh, of the um, internal tide in this simulation, which is the horizontally propagating wave. Above we have the M2 zonal velocity at the first time step of the simulation with the corresponding contours, and below the same thing quarter of a period later with the contours uh, which belong to the first time step. And we can see that, for example, the lines that are lying on top of the zero velocities are then lying on top of the maxima of the zone of velocity, which suggests the propagation. The same also happens when we look at the meridian of velocity. When we then look at both of these variables at the same time step, so we have above zonal and below meridian of velocity, the contours are in, uh, concentrating on this, on the zonal velocity. We see again this shift, which in this case indicates that the uh, meridian and zonal velocity are 90 degrees out of phase from each other. So now we want to come to this interaction and study what do the eddies do to the different modes of the internal tide. In order to be able to do this, we need to first decompose the internal tide into the low and high modes. And how this has been done mostly in the future is based on linear wave theory and the solution of the sturm liouville eigenvalue problem, which allows us for a separation of the horizontal and vertical equations and can give a solution for the vertical structure. In this case, we see an example for the horizontal velocities where we have the blue line having one zero crossing is the mode one. The higher the modes, the more nodes in the vertical. Um, this theory is mainly um, valid for particular assumptions. For example, we have to have constant stratification and also horizontally uniform uh, buoyancy frequency. We also need plane wave assumption uh, with constant wavelength and for each grid point, a flat bottom topography, which is perfectly valid for a doc localized domain around each grid point but it doesn't really give us enough information about the dependence between neighboring points in a bigger area as we have now. And also it doesn't give us a link between the horizontal and the vertical structures. This is something that we really are interested in since we can now resolve this whole area of the internal tide with a very high resolution model. So we want to decompose the mode so that we find a link between horizontal and vertical structures for this complete area. And we do this by suggesting a new model decomposition method, which is based on EOF spatial analysis. Here I'm just showing how I am processing my data. So after the run, I do the harmonic analysis, and the next step would be to decompose again those three-dimensional data into two-dimensional EOF patterns and one-dimensional vertical principal components. The decomposition we do until around mode 10, we have the EOFs depending on X and Y and the corresponding components depending on the depth. The EOFs are calculated like this, so it, they, they include both information about the amplitude and the phase of the wave, which come from the harmonic analysis. And with this, we can then reconstruct the velocity for each mode N, as you can see here, using both the PCs to give us the vertical structure of the modes and also the corresponding um, EOF patterns in the horizontal. And this is what we find out. So above we have again the zone of velocity in full in one particular depth and below the mode one. We can see that the patterns of the beams and the positions of the extrema are quite well represented by mode one. Um, the variability of mode one is around 75%. The total four first modes, which we call the low modes, account for 98% of the total variability. The rest six account for the rest one point something percent. We want to check now whether this method actually captures the features of the internal tide that we saw before. Here we're focusing on the horizontal propagation. This is exactly what I was showing before, the full velocity, and here the same case for mode one. First time step, quarter of a period later. We can see, again, I don't want to show again the lines, but I think it's visible, 
the EFT composition captures this propagating fe feature of the waves quite well in the first mode of the internal tide. The same thing we have for the meridional velocity. When we now move to the higher modes of the decomposition, I'm showing here an example of a quite high mode, mode 9, but from mode 5 to 10, the structures look fairly similar. We can see that we have a lot smaller horizontal structures and also values for the velocities, and those stronger signals are mostly concentrated on these specific locations that you can see, which are very well collocated with the eddies of the area, which are shown by the contour lines. This is a very interesting uh, result so far, and we believe we also see some trapping of high modes inside the eddies. Though for this example of no mode one, the structures are quite small, and it might be that our horizontal resolution is not actually resolving this mode nine modes, and we might need to go into high resolution to be sure about this exact result. Looking at the structures now, these are the corresponding PCs which indicate the modes. We have the first mode shown or uh, combined with the blue line and the ninth combined with the ninth uh, red line. We see the direct link between the horizontal and vertical uh, structures which is given by construction due, the, due to this EOF decomposition. Looking at the scales, we have in the vertical decreasing scales with increasing mode and in the horizontal as well. Those wavelengths that we um, calculate here given by the face information, mode one until mode five are quite well um, in accordance to other papers with other models, uh, storm tide and HICOM for example. The higher we go, we still see that the horizontal resolution doesn't really decay as we would expect it to be, which is another indication that between mode five and mode nine, maybe the resolution is actually not sufficient enough. Looking now at the interaction that we are interested in, um, I, saw, I said before that I have two months for each season. This is why um, we are trying to use the first month as a reference month. We focus on one particular beam, which during the first month of the simulation has no contact to an eddy. The same beam during the second month, which we call a comparison month, is covered by an eddy, so it has interacted with the eddy. And this is how we want to be able to compare the, this one same beam and be able to see what is actually um, the eddy influence on that. What we see here are some frequency spectra before and after the interaction. Because of time, I'm only going to focus on the zoom, which is here around the M2 frequency before the interaction is shown by blue and afterwards by orange, we can see that the spectral energy is reduced around the semidurnal frequencies. Not only the M2 one, but also the next peak is somewhere here, is the S2 semidurnal uh, frequency, which is another indication of weakening of the internal tide because of the interaction. Another interesting part we can see here is that there is actually no eddy related frequency shift of the M2 peak, at least with the frequency that we are able to resolve, which is something like one over one hour. We don't see that the eddy shifts the frequency of the M2 tide. Uh, yeah, continuing with the results, we see here uh, this one beam that I was talking about during the reference month, which has no contact to an eddy. What we see is that during the comparison month, when the eddy has interacted with the beam, the propagation direction of the beam has changed in the horizontal. In fact, it has been refracted southwards. When we now look along those beams in a cross section, we have here the plot for mode one, where we can see that the structures is, are mainly uniform all along the water column. There is some dissipation as the beam propagates away from the generation point. But uh, in fact, this dissipation is a lot stronger in, in the case where the eddy is present, not only inside the eddy and below the eddy, but also in the lee part of the eddy, so after the interaction has occurred. Looking back to the higher modes, as I mentioned before, we see this trapping of the structures inside the eddies. When we now have a look at the cross section, which is shown here on the right, um, on the x-axis, I have the longitude, and around 9 and 11 south is more or less the, the eddy located. We can see that those strong uh, signals 
are captured inside this water column where the eddy is located all along the water column, while outside of that the values are quite, quite weak, which is um, actually something that we were not really expecting since the eddies are only around 1,000 meters deep. Now, um, coming back to what was found before, um, the indication of a scatter scattering from lower to higher modes. Uh, here we look again at those two months of the simulation, the reference and the comparison month, and we wanted to try to understand whether we also see some scattering from lower to higher modes. What we see is actually that already in the reference month, there is some trapping of higher modes in locations where the low mode beams were actually not quite strong. Just to remind you, the low mode beam that we were focusing on was along minus 32. There were some also a bit southwards, but not really in this area. What we see though is that those high mode structures are already um, present here and already trapped inside the eddies. And what happens a month later during the comparison month is only that those structures have propagated together with the eddy as the eddies flow from this direction to the north uh, west. So there is a trapping and propagation inside the eddies, but not a clear example of scattering from low modes to high modes. What we believe that is actually maybe happening here is that those modes are generated somewhere outside of the area that we are interested in, uh, close to Madagascar. So between Madagascar and African continent, we also have some strong internal tides. And this is where the eddies are actually uh, getting formed and coming from. Uh, so at least for this simulation, which is quite short to admit, um, we don't see a clear example of scattering. Uh, some questions that arise after this analysis is, of course, what happens to this energy that we see being uh, reduced? inside or after the interaction of the eddies. Where does it go? Is there any transfer between the modes? Uh, the next step we're planning to do is to uh, calculate an energy budget for this area to study the energy transport and actually try to quantify how much of the energy of these low modes is maybe transported into higher modes or to the eddies or mean flow or whatever. Another interesting point as an outlook would be to have a global estimate for the importance of eddy internal tide interactions. We actually looked at several other locations where both features are present, both the eddies and the internal tides. They are quite hard to find. You really need some very good conditions and also some good timing that you have a beam clearly eddy free before and then the eddy flowing into the beam to be able to compare the same beam before and after. But it will be very interesting to have a global estimate or a bigger picture of these interactions and not only this one example. And of course, comparison with observations, and this is something that can happen in this CRC-181. We already had two cruises in the exact area. You see here the Walvis Ridge, and this is the track of one of the two cruises that we had. Uh, so there is a lot of observational data available, which uh, can be used to be compared with the model data that we have so far or that we can have in the future with future runs. Just a small um, summary, I still have one minute left. Um, concerning the model, we had a look at how does the internal tide look like in a realistic simulation. We saw the interesting feature of the horizontally propagating wave. We asked ourselves what is an appropriate model decomposition method to do this. We propose this EOF spatial analysis which gives us a direct link be between the vertical modes and the structures in the horizontal. We then looked into the se several modes and their structures in the horizontal and vertical. We find that we are able to resolve some higher modes, but we cannot go too high. The resolution is very important in this case, and we have to be very careful how to interpret, for example, mode 10, as I said before. Concerning, concerning the interaction between tides and eddies, we saw that we have a horizontally changing um, direction um, or propagation direction of the beam after the interaction with the eddy. Uh, we saw the trapping, but no clear example of scattering. And we also saw some weakening of the internal tide, both in the spectral energy, which I showed in the spectra, but also kinetic energy, which in this case I didn't show. That was it. Um.
10 seconds. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, so uh, when you were talking about this sort of interaction between the ID and the internal tide, so uh, did you come across uh, any sort of like the changes in the ID, like let's say the, the rotational and the translational velocity and the sh shape and size and the amplitude of the ID due to the internal tides? Um, this is of course also possible. So when we talk about an interaction, both features are interacting with each other, right? In this case, we are only focusing on what happens to the internal tide because of the ID. And since the eddies are actually propagating and traveling, it's a bit harder, I would say, to uh, go the other way around and see what happens to the eddy because of a tide. There have been papers with idealized setups where they could see that actually the eddy is accelerating after the interaction. I think in this case, it will be a bit harder, and we also didn't really focus on what happens to the eddy. What is the energy level of eddy and wave in these cases? Because the scattering is very sensitive to the relative energy level. So the eddy and wave, mm -hmm. what are the energy levels like? Mm -hmm. If you drew a spectrum of yeah. wave and eddy, how would they so look? So in the, in the spectrum, so you can see maybe... Uh, oh. do, do you have energy spectra? So these uh, are the frequency spectra that I've done. Uh, with the uh, power spectra density here. But this doesn't have eddy spectra, right? Where is the... No, I'm only choosing locations uh, which are located either inside of the eddy or after the interaction, and uh, the ones before the interaction. But in the region there. you have, the localized region you look at, if yes. you were to plot energy spectra, how would they look? I haven't done this, to be honest. Yeah, because that sure. would decide whether scattering appears or not. If the eddies are too weak, there would be no scattering. I don't believe they are too weak. They're actually quite strong. The Agulas eddies, they can propagate also towards the other part of the Atlantic. So you had slides showing the scattering was very weak, right? You don't see much scattering? Yeah, I, well, what we think is happening is because our run is quite short, we cannot really identify a, a clear example of scattering. We don't, we don't say it's not happening. It can, it can happen, but we just don't really see it in this case. And what is the difficulty in running this longer? Uh, data size. <laughs> So we have three-dimensional global data for with one hour output. And this is already quite huge. That's why we're also only concentrating on this particular idea. We're cropping everything else to focus here to be able to work with the data. And it's five kilometers globally, which is very, very big. Uh, when you are um, tech, talking about um, shifting up uh, scattering AD into higher to lower or lower to uh, higher modes of COF or EOF, uh, so how you physically interpret this? Uh, I mean, is it affecting the shape of the tide or splitting of energy? Or uh, you can you interpret it physically or it's just mathematical? Uh, yeah. The EOF decomposition, you mean? Uh, in the last slide, you have shown that uh, the scattering uh, of eddy into uh, in, in between modes actually, um, from lower to higher modes, higher to lower modes. So, how you interpret it physically um, in terms of the shape of tides or splitting up energy of tides, uh, those things? Yeah. So the the lower modes are the structures that we saw before those those bigger waves, which a lot which are a lot longer, and the structures of the higher modes are very very small. So we believe the longer modes or the lower modes cannot be really trapped inside the eddy because of those huge structures that they have, while the smaller structures are easily to get captured. Okay. The energy is also a lot smaller in the case of the higher modes. Also, the amount of variability that they can explain um, based on the decomposition is also a lot smaller than the higher modes, but this is also something that we would expect. Is this answering your question? Yeah, but in the uh, last slide you have shown uh, uh, scattering of eddy in between modes, uh, from lower to higher modes. Uh, so what is that signifying? This would mean that the lower modes in the vertical, which are which have like only one zero crossing, for example, okay. uh, scatter into higher vertical modes with several zero crossings. Okay. That is mathematical, uh, or you are uh, yes. saying it physically. 
is that any physical implication or can you be interpreted physically that is as it affecting or the splitting of energy or tidal tidal waves or shape, its shape or not yeah so the this scattering process we believe that actually dissipates the energy uh, from the low modes to higher modes because they are turning into more unstable modes which can break more easily okay. and then dissipate the energy from the lower modes to your turbulence or smaller scale energy. Thank you. I think also the Hello. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I had three short questions. The first one was regarding the decomposition. So the field that you give into the UAF decomposition, is it after splitting into barotropic, baroclinic and filtering out the M2 signal? Yes. Okay. And whatever is the low frequency you call that an AD? Uh, we only do the UAF decomposition for the M2 internal tidal velocities. Right. So we don't decompose the eddy. So that brings to my second question. Like you said about high modes, M2s are trapped in eddies. Is there any modal structure of these eddies? Are they low mode eddies, high mode eddies? Would that? Uh, we haven't looked at the structure of the eddies. We consider them to be mesoscale just because of their outer radius, let's say, which is around 100, 120 kilometers big. Uh, but of course, a lot of things are happening inside the eddies as well. This is true. I see. Uh, uh, most probably with the, with the energy budget that we are planning to do, we will be more able to also see what happens inside the eddy. Okay, uh, so the final question is, can you tell the Rossby number of the regions you're looking at? Is it sub-mesoscale, mesoscale? It's mesoscale. We cannot resolve sub-mesoscale five kilometer run. But the primitive equations you're using, you're not applying the hydrostatic balance in the primitive equations? Uh, you mean how the model is solving? In the model, yeah. Um, I think not, but I'm not very sure about that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, can you comment on how interaction of internal tides with eddies is any different from interaction of uh, just other inertial gravity waves with eddies? Yes, so this is what I, I try to show in the. Can maybe I close this? Uh, so in the spectra where I talked about no frequency shift, this is something that, um, for example, for trapping of inertial, uh, near inertial waves inside eddies is the mechanism that happens, so the frequency is shifted. And it's something that we do not see here. So this would be one difference. Uh, and when does it make sense to, to do this modal decomposition versus uh, beams? Uh, you know, like you could do a WKB where the tides are propagating in the vertical uh, as well as the horizontal, particularly for the high modes. I'm just wondering if when it makes sense to, to go with the, the modes and thinking of the propagation as only being horizontal and when it makes sense to think of the tides as uh, one of your pictures showed the tides kind of coming off and propagating away at some angle from the topography in the vertical. I showed this? No, I don't think I showed this. I thought so. Uh, so we consider the internal tide to be in the vertical um, a standing wave between I, I know, but, but is, that, is there a regime where that makes sense and a regime where it doesn't? I guess that's my question. I think it depends on the data that we have. When you have such a model which can resolve uh, such a huge area, it makes sense to take into account this decomposition, which directly gives you a link between the horizontal and vertical scales. While when you have observational data, which can be maybe one mooring at one particular point in, uh, in space and only one vertical profile, then you can also quite easily use through Leoville decomposition, which gives you this one profile. Thank you. See, are there any other questions? Or? One in the chat, maybe can you... Yeah, so in the chat, um, can the EF decomposition be applied for other hydrodynamic simulations, such as in AIM-HD? Also suggest materials to learn EF in detail. Oh. Uh, so the first part, um, I'm not aware of AIM-HD, but there has been actually 
uh, or there is being an ongoing collaboration with a PhD student from Australia who uses MOM6 and who also applied this method and find similar results as we do. The method itself, this decomposition, should be model independent. So I would say it can also be used for other simulations. And materials, um, I can, I don't have a name right now in my head, but I can search and then also share it with the organizers together with the rest of the work. Just while we're waiting to see if there are any other questions, I uh, just want to uh, ask people that have posters to put up to take advantage of the lunch break to, to do that. The, the trapping of waves that you described, do you see a preferential trapping in anticyclone versus cyclone? Um, so in this case, we only have anticyclonic eddies. Uh, we yeah, are no, only focusing No cyclonic on eddies in the whole region? No, with, the, with the mean that we are looking at, so we're taking a mean of a week to plot those contours for the eddies, and we only see anticyclonic ones for the Agula swings. There could be a difference, of course, when they are rotating the other way around, but in this area, we don't find any cases. Louis, again, for a very nice talk. So.